I'd like to call the Reading Municipal Light Department Board of Commissioners meeting to order. This meeting of the uh, Reading Municipal Light Department Board of Commissioners is being broadcast live at RMLD's office at 230 Ash Street in Reading, Massachusetts. Live broadcasts are available only in Reading due to technology constraints. This meeting was videotaped for distribution to the community television stations in North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. The RMLD Board of Commissioners recognizes the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the chair on items on the official agenda as well as items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions or comments from the public be directed to the chair and that all parties, including members of the RMLD Board, act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the board or responding to comments. Once recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and address prior to speaking. It is the role of the chair to maintain order in all public comment or ensuing discussion. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, John Stenpeck, uh, Commissioner, to be the board secretary this evening. John? Thank you. Okay. Uh, we uh, don't have anyone here, I believe, for public comment, so uh, I'd like to also indicate that uh, normally we, we do have representation from the Citizens Advisory Board, but uh, Dave Nelson uh, was not feeling well at the last moment, so unable to attend, and the other CAB members have prior commitments, so there will not be a CAB representation for this meeting. Uh, at this time, uh, we'll do a review of the RMLD fiscal year 2016 operating budget, so uh, ask for Colleen to uh, please introduce that. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, um, as you know, the um, Citizens Advisory Board voted uh, and approved um, to recommend both the capital and expense operating budget. And so tonight we finished the second phase of our uh, budget. Um, as you know, we changed to a six-year plan last year, which shows FY15 year to date, uh, FY16, which we'll be voting on, along uh, with five other years or four other years up to FY20, which is intended to match our long-term strategic plan, our capital improvement plan, and gives uh, everyone uh, an idea of going out five years, what to expect. Um, so you'll notice uh, after the organizational study presentation, uh, in addition to some comments that I made at the meeting before last that our operating ratio, which ensures sufficient margin when sales are down, was not uh, where, really, where it should be. And so instead of um, setting the rate of return around five to six and a half percent, uh, we are setting it closer to eight so that we can ensure that that does not occur. With that, though, I do want to make a comment that the efficiency of our work processes, which was also part of some of the organizational study, we've made tremendous strides in improving those, uh, reducing costs, uh, and uh, we are also still have six vacancies um, that we have. So there really isn't a question of, well, are your expenses too high because of um, you know, inefficiencies? And while a lot of those are in the works, I feel confident that you know these these um, increases are going to be necessary uh, next year, and Jane's going to speak a little bit more, and probably going into the future. But we're keeping a close eye on it, and we're having financial meetings monthly now to look at the um, budget to actual. So uh, with that, you know we had a minus one percent um, load growth from six seventy five kilowatt hours to 668 kilowatt hours, that's a typical, right? And um, I'll turn it over to Jane. She's going to uh, speak a little bit more on that. Yep, um, so I guess <coughs> if we could just flip this slide to the six-year plan. Um, it's probably a little difficult to see, but you all have it in, in, your, uh, right. in your books. Um, the driving factor in order for us to achieve um, the bottom line or our rate of return um, is driven by our base revenues. Uh, purchase power uh, in terms of base capacity, transmission, and energy is passed through to the customers. So whatever those costs come in, they're passed through directly back to the customers and there's no return made on those. So the only way for the department to make any return is on the base revenues. 
which is, is listed on the first line of the six-year plan. Um, it, it's anticipated, according when this budget was presented or developed, that uh, for fiscal year 15, our uh, base revenues are anticipated to come in around 21.4 million. Um, when you follow that through to the bottom line, um, that uh, achieves a rate of return of around a little over 6%. Um, so as Colleen had mentioned, um, in order for us to increase that operating reserve margin in, in the event of decreased sales, um, it's necessary to achieve a base revenue of around $23 million. Um, so the overall impact of that to the customers is uh, our group looked at all the different rate classes and applied um, the increase to the base portion as well as to the purchase power capacity, transmission, and energy. And depending on your rate class, because how much you use your energy and what your demand is, it varies by customer class and usage. Um, but when looking at all the rate classes, um, in order to achieve that 23 million, the average across all our rate classes is around a 3% overall rate increase. Um, just so uh, that number is critical in flowing through uh, the, the, the balance of the expenses um, and then to achieve uh, the net income for the fiscal year of $3 million, a little over $3 million. And then going out the, the, um, the next four or five years, there's going to be necessary for additional base increases because our expenses are going up. Insurance, gasoline, fuel, non-purchase power, as well as purchase power. Um, in the coming years, capacity and tra transmission are going to increase significantly. We're trying to develop our programs to minimize that impact. Um, so that that pass through um, is as, as small as it can be. Uh, but there are definitely going to be increases to our customers and we're trying to ma maintain those in an efficient manner. <clears throat> if I may make a comment uh, as well. <clears throat> uh, I think we, it's been in the, the news as well with NSTAR and Eversource and their increases are going up by uh, two digits instead of one digit. I mean, they're going up in the 20, 30 percent range. So right. going up in the 3 percent per year range, uh, CAGR seems to be extremely reasonable. Sure. Um, just to compare that, I live in an Eversource, um, <laughs> no, and I live in National Grid. They have, Eversource hasn't bought them yet, but it is, that's <laughs> nice. But 771 kilowatt hours I was paying, after I did my LED conversion in my house, I got the bill from 120 down to $80. And then with the recent increases by National Grid, I'm now paying 170. Wow. wow. For the same kilowatt hours just to give you an idea of how much they've gone up realistically. You know? So my girls can only flat iron their hair once a week. <laughs> <laughs> but what I was going to mention was proactively, in order to uh, convey this to the towns, the meetings that we had with all four towns and all four town managers and the selectmen, I let them all know for their budget mm. input uh, purposes in March that we would probably be having between a set of 3 and 5 percent right. increase. So this should not, you know, we're trying to do that so that they have that for their budget input and we'll go right along so it doesn't come as a surprise. Good, good. That's Great. been done. Tom, can I ask a quick question? Yes, sure, Dave. Jane, I think you said it's go the base has gone up seven and a quarter percent, but the net to the, to the customer will be much less than that? It's Correct, all. because uh, the base portion yeah. it represents only about 20 to 25 percent of the overall line items within an electric bill. Okay. Uh, purchase power is the majority of that cost. Um, so when you have that magnitude of an increase, purchase power going from this current fiscal year to um, fiscal year 16 is pretty much flat. Our capacity costs are going down uh, in, in, uh, in advance of a, a significant increase for fiscal year 17. Okay. Um, and then the transmission went up about 1.3 million, capacity went down 1.2, so that was pretty flat. And our energy are, are, are within two to $500,000. So for an overall $65 million budget, um, uh, expense budget, um, that's pretty flat. So by being able to maintain that larger portion static, the smaller increase results in an overall increase of approximately 3%. OK, thank you. Yep. Good. Uh, 
So what I've done is uh, I've summarized the uh, operating budget, a little, not to oversimplify it, but just to show you the highlights of what's contained in the detail here. But first and foremost, just to reiterate, uh, the RMLD's operating budget is not a line item budget. We give that kind of detail to help the reader see where the expenses are coming from, but we're not a line item budget. So what I've done is uh, we're presenting to you tonight an 89.5 million revenue budget of which 86.5 million is expenses. What I've shown on this. Um, uh, excuse me, Bob. Is that a uh, page in, in here? Yep. So. What page is it? In, in the book. Gene, is that. It should, be, should be part of the handout. No? Did you, get, you don't have it? Oh, I don't know. We, I, 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 we have the six year plan. I'm looking for the page a number at the bottom of that so I can switch to it. Uh, I don't believe it's included, yep. but I could be mistaken. Okay. Uh, in that case, could you just enlarge the uh, print up there? That'd be fine. Is it, is it on there, Gene? Page one. Did you check page one? Yeah, page one. Yep. It says total expenses on the lower left hand corner. Oh, the total operating expenses on page one? Is that readable? I think so. Page, page two. Page two. Okay, so this is just a separate um, breakout then. Yeah. This is a summary of, of all the detail in here just to give a nice 10,000-foot uh, view of it. Good, okay. I, and I think Jane's got it, captured it up there so we can read it. Yep, good. So we're going to start. So um, we're looking at $86.5 million basically of expenses that we're submitting for approval for tonight. And if you look at the fixed cost portion, and Jane's already alluded to some of this earlier, uh, public part, very highly fixed cost business. You look at the capacity transmission and fuel, we really have no say uh, in those costs. So we, we, just, we just itemize those out. Depreciation is based on, uh, on our gross plant, and, and that's a fixed number, and we use 3%. Uh, the town payments, we're locked into that per the 20-year agreement. Uh, the return on investment to the town of Reading, we're locked into that agreement also too. Uh, and then there's just... Uh, Disposable losses, which are net assets, which have been disposed of, uh, try to be fully, fully depreciated. So when you look at the 86.5 million expenses, about 72 million of that, or about 83 percent, we really have no say as to where those costs are, or, or any control over them. Then you look at the semi-variable costs, and the biggest piece there is the labor. So this here represents the expense labor portion that's taken out of the capital. Thank you. The, the labor is broken up between the capital uh, and, and expense side. So about 5.5 million represents the labor expense side. The next big expense that we have is employee pension and benefits, which as trustees of the pension trust, you see that contribution we make every year, plus all the health insurance, life insurance, and the benefits that go for the employees. The next big item is the 1.8 million, which says groups all. And what that is, what that represents is each department has unique expenses to itself. So I just grouped all like meter, station, line, accounting, customer service, all those expenses I just grouped because they, they're unique to those particular departments. So for instance, like in accounting, my uh, 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 town treasurer accountant services would be part of that group cost. Uh, conservation expenses, another G, uh, Jane wants to talk about a little bit. Uh, we have about $816,000 budgeted uh, for that expense. Now here again, we have that separate rate on our bill just to cover those conservation expenses. I don't know if you want to talk about future programs or we're good. If they have any questions. Again, all of our conservation programs are funded through a line item on our budget. So the money's collected, Bob accounts for those, and then the, any expenses for commercial rebates, appliance rebates, our residential audits, um, all of that gets passed through to, from that conservation if it needs to be cut off funds. Um, 
And so, and so like my monthly financials, I'll always be put on the uh, energy conservation fund balance. That's the difference of the monies that we've collected and yet haven't spent yet. And I think that's spending about 500, a little over $500,000 right now. So we've collected more than we've been able to give back on the conservation programs. Hmm. And if I could just add, for the efficiency engineer position that's been vacant for a little over two years was filled last week. Wow. Uh, so Excellent. we're hoping that we can be a little more proactive with the programs and the balance will not be at a high level going forward. Well, excuse me, just a question. So uh, in our book, there's a, uh, a total operating expense number of 83,967 for 23. So it's obviously it's about a two and a half million. That, so the, the sum is this uh, a further. Yeah. So if you look at the non-operating expenses at the bottom yep. of the of the six-year plan, okay, about two point yeah. five million. All right. I you see. Add it. those two together, okay. you come back to the eighty-six five. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Uh, the next big ticket item we have is, is the tree trimming. We we have uh, we have three crews now that'll be doing that. We we change vendors on that, and the new process seems to be working pretty well. Uh, overtime expense. This is the uh, expense portion of it. We've got about a little over uh, a half million dollars uh, allocated to that. That also includes any uh, storm emergency overtime that we may incur. And here again, it's just a budgeted figure. It doesn't mean we're going to spend all this money, but here's what we have set aside in case of the need. And then the rest is just, uh, you know, property insurance, uh, a little less than $500,000 uh, on that. Professional services, which are legal services, mostly are our, uh, legal, uh, accounting, our, our audit, uh, any consultants that may be doing some work for us that's on the expense side of things, uh, that, that's captured there. Uh, office supplies, uh, in parentheses it says uh, customer credit card fees. Per FERC, Federal Energy Re Regulatory Commission, uh, Bank fees are, are called office supplies. So the, this here represents all my credit card fees uh, that our customers, when they use their credit card, that we get charged. Now, it may look like a hefty number, but what that enables us to do is when we're doing our credit and collections, um, we have, we have a, a rate payer on the line. They will gladly give us their credit card and pay arrears rather than us setting up payment plans, uh, mailing out uh, termination notices, rolling out a truck to do a shut off, you call them up, uh, you tell them, you know, you're, you're on the uh, credit watch, they'll say, can I use my credit card to pay? So even though that number is significant, the hidden cost that we save is, is enormous. Sure. Um, vehicle, that's just for the maintenance of the, of the, of the fleet, uh, about $280,000 budgeted for that. Uh, rent expense, the Barbers building behind us, we have that number there. Something Colleen has been pushing for and trying to get the, um, RMLD employees uh, uh, better better trains that training expense about two hundred twenty five thousand dollars on that for all, for the whole company. It also includes some tuition reimbursement that uh, the employees are allowed to under uh, board policy to uh, attend class. Uh, transformer expense. A lot of this has to do with um, has this material in case a transformer uh, goes south on us and there might be a spill. Uh, we we ballparked about three hundred thousand dollars for that. Uh, bad debt expense, uh, we have $120,000. Right now, what we're looking at for uh, FY15 is uh, well below that, but for budget purposes, we put $120,000 in there. Uh, injuries and damages is just claims put in by our rate payers where we may have incurred some, we may have caused some damage on their personal property. And then the uh, RMLB and CAB expenses per their budget is uh, uh, really insignificant. So. You know, we have about 84%, about $72 million, which is pretty much fixed. And you have about 17%, about $14.5 million, which is really what the wiggle room is. But even those, as you can see, they're pretty, pretty set. Uh, yeah, you can cut that. You're going to allow stuff reliability or services or uh, adversely affect customer service. So in a nutshell, this is what you're approving tonight is uh, the $86.5 million in, in operating expenses. Any questions from the board members? No, I, um, the, the only um, observation is that, I mean, even on the labor front, that's through the three various unions that are <coughs> associated with the RMLD, right? So that's all negotiated Correct. Uh, for a multi-year type of uh, uh, effort. And the same thing, I assume, with the, with the overtime. Uh, it's also very structured and very laid out. 
Right. The, the labor represents all the RMLD employees, less the capital portion that's already been allocated out. Uh, the, the overtime itself, too, you're right, some of it is contractually. We're obligated to, uh, to provide that, but it also includes for emergencies or storms throughout the year. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, Bob, and this may be for Colleen as well, um, you know, we heard last meeting the presentation on, on the uh, recommendations from the two studies, so I imagine that some of those studies will, uh, when the action items are implemented, will incur some costs either in staff uh, increases or, you know, changes in compensation if that was appropriate. So I'm just wondering, does that get reflected here or how would we, because obviously we want to be supportive of the changes that we ultimately have put before us. So do those costs get somehow reflected in, in this operating budget or are they handled uh, separately as we move through the year? Um, well, the organizational charts that they recommended are still being vetted. Yeah. Um, but say, so if we were to hire. So uh, if we, be, because we have six vacancies right now and we have some changes yeah. that are already happening, um, you know, I'm trying to look at those vacancies first. Right. Um, the study recommended, I think, another four employees, um, but that still has to be looked at. So there may be, for the next year, probably a give and take where, where you wouldn't really have a lot of change, but right. probably the following yeah. year's budget, you'd probably have an impact of maybe. Yeah, I guess what I was wondering if there's if there's a particular change that you felt or the staff felt would make a huge difference in the operations efficiency or productivity or right. or long run uh, kinds of benefits do we have the opportunity to approve those outside of the normal budget process so so you don't have to because some may be able to wait like you said because you've got to vet through the recommendations and that takes time but you could well be ready in November to pull the trigger on some of the changes but they may not be covered in the operating budget and if the budget's kind of tight but it's an important change, we would want to make sure you have the opportunity to do that. So does, is that something that can be served up to the, the board? I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I do. Yeah. 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 I, I think if you look at the other slide, the, uh, the headcount slide. Yep. Uh, Bob, I think the question is a mid-year approval process could occur, right? Has that could occur, in but the, past? I mean, the point I was going to try to make, though, too, is that I think some of the um, – mm -hmm recommendations that Lytos will probably be making, we've already incorporated into the budget, i.e. the engineer. We already kind of knew we needed that, and I think they're kind of probably referring that we, we had one more, and we've already incorporated that into the budget already. Now, there could be others down the road, but we, we think we've addressed uh, uh, some of them already. The immediate needs have been put yeah. in there, but it's, there's only one position. The rest of them are already currently vacant. Yeah, but you do, I guess that's the right Framing of the but question, the Colleen. There's is, a can you do a, like, for example, we have we are building a substation in Wilmington because of the load. So for me and Peter, we're to find property, and that's not budgeted, and it's it's outside of the cost that we've put in the budget on that item for building the substation. Yeah. We would probably come forward and ask for permission to to make an addendum to the budget. Okay. So. Um, <coughs> I'm just not seeing anything really significant from the organizational study for this year. Right. But should something come, we would Good. follow that process. Good. Yeah, it's really about providing the, the resources to get the benefits that I, I know you're working on. Good. Great. So that's, uh, that's my presentation with the operating budget. Are there any questions? Yeah, I guess to, just to ask it out loud, so we uh, actually, the question was raised, I think, by one of the consultants. So I, I guess from the board's point of view, is to make sure the budget as stated, does that, do you feel reasonably comfortable, Colleen, with your staff, that that's sufficient operating funds to, to accomplish what, you know, you want to get done this fiscal year? Yeah, I think it takes into consideration the maintenance that we've been working on. <coughs> um, our, our labor costs for capital have been lower than expected uh, because of the labor for the expense side. So we're trying to capture that. We're trying to capture the training um, we're trying to capture um, the changes, uh, the corporate, you know, organizational structure structure changes. But at the same time, we're, I'm trying to lay this out in a in a slower fashion so that we're not hit with anything because we have other costs that are coming down the pike, like substation needs and things like that. So we're just trying to balance it all out. So I feel comfortable with what we've put down here uh, to capture at least getting the system 
where it needs to be the reliability report in what was demonstrated as um, the first and second quarter of the rest of this year and then the first and second quarter of next year if you refer to your reliability and organizational report. Good. Other questions from the, from the board? No. Okay. Uh, are we ready for a action item for a vote? Could we have a, a uh, recommendation for uh, approval? John, do you want to make a sure. motion? Um, do I need the... Uh, yeah, you should have it. Yeah. 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 Uh, move that the RMLD uh, board recommend uh, the um, fiscal year 16 operating budget with a net income of three million twelve thousand and seventy dollars as presented. I have a second. Second. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, based on the recommendation of the CAB. Right. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Good. Thank. Thank you, Gene. Uh, any discussion? Okay, none, none being uh, heard, so all in favor? Okay, so motion approves 4-0. Uh, I, I wanted to make a comment because uh, it affects the, uh, one of the next items on the agenda. So Commissioner Pacino is uh, running very late due to some significant traffic delays, so uh, that's why he's not here, but uh, we're expecting that he uh, hopefully will find his way through the traffic and join us. So I'd like to suggest we, uh, we delay uh, on the uh, Chairman of the board report, uh, which Phil is going to cover in terms of the accounts payable warrant. Okay, is any, everyone okay with that? Yes. Yes. I just uh, just a, a, a comment which we can think about. Uh, it's an item that came up relative to the, both the operating expense budget and the capex budget uh, at one of the cab meetings that was actually regarding the uh, approval of the capex budget. So, I know this year was uh, very challenging because we had two huge studies and CapEx budget and operating expense budget and trying to do those all in one or two meetings was very challenging. But the, the question that got brought up and discussed is the wisdom of whether we'd like to do CapEx and operating expense in one meeting, I know that's challenging, or more specifically the approval process in one meeting, the idea being rather than looking at them as discrete items is obviously a lot of dependency between CapEx and operating uh, budget and, and your willingness to maybe approve an expense budget uh, versus a CapEx budget, wanting to see both, you know, hand in hand. So I guess I'd just see if there's any uh, a discussion now on that, if we want to think about it. But I, I think in principle it makes sense. I know the, the, the realities are that they're both significant budgets to go through, but absence big organizational studies and reliability studies you know, with a, a little longer meeting, we could probably get through it. It just seems like it might be a, a, a better process. To, so at the end, we're sure that we're providing, uh, you know, the right uh, review and, and approving the budget that makes the most sense. So any discussion or comment? Uh, I have no bias either way. Um, yeah. I think it is uh, a lot of material to go through yeah. and to kind of consume actually outside of here right. before we actually get into actually asking the questions. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I could go either way. and makes no difference to me. Um, I think it would just be a question of how much time or there is involved and or uh, is, there a, uh, is there a reason to separate the two uh, a month apart in terms of approval process. And Gene, do you have uh, any historical perspective on this? Yeah, I mean, another thought, I don't know if this violates any uh, past practice or uh, regulatory requirements, but another compromise is to review, say, CapEx, uh, defer the actual approval process, so answer, review, answer any questions, and delay the actual vote on the budget till you get through the following week or second weeks, whenever we, we try to do them fairly close together. It, it really, for me, is just around, uh, there is a little bit, uh, I, I have some empathy towards doing it uh, together or the approval process really together because you're really approving one in a vacuum. So, I mean, if you, it, it wouldn't happen, but if the CapEx budget was significant, we approved it, and then the operating expense budget, you know, was very uh, challenging and, you know, we weren't uh, showing a lot of profitability, you know, the <laughs> someone might say, well, gee, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe the CapEx is too generous. So. Right. Um, so I don't know, is that is that a, a feasible? Could we do a review of CapEx at, say, the first meeting and then 
uh, answer any questions and then uh, defer the actual voting of the budget in tandem so you end up, yeah. That, that, might, be a, that might be a logical yeah. way yeah. to do it. Uh, because nothing happens, you know, from that one meeting to the next in terms of any. So right. we get through the discussion, which I think is the important part in the review, and then we can just make a, a single motion. Okay, it's fine with me. I like that. All right. Do we do we want to make a formal vote on that, or do we want to do we need to do that? Is I don't that think more we just a process? absolutely need to do that. I mean, it's not even a policy. It's yeah. a just process. A process. Yeah. Yeah, I guess whichever one. If it, I guess the the really the the end game is we just want to make one final motion to approve both capex and operating expense. So we could do operating expense first and then defer a vote on it till we complete the. No, the, we should probably run that past the CAP as well, right? Because they see it first. Well, the CAP has a conversation with the members. Yeah. But the thing is, if they don't agree or they want, well, then we'll yeah. It'd be the same thing, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. actually, uh, I can say, you know, pretty much, uh, we, I'm sure we could refer to the minutes, uh, the discussion happened at CAB, C and they, well. they, were, they were proponents of doing that. Good. That was really okay. the, the genesis of the question. So. Excellent. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, uh, next, uh, we're going to defer, as I said, on the uh, accounts payable warrant discussion. So next, uh, Colleen, we have uh, general manager's okay. report. Thank you. Um, I just had a couple of topics to bring out. One was uh, the Town of Reading Community Development Department is having an economic development meeting on the evening of June 3rd. Uh, and included in that discussion is um, the zoning. Uh, I believe they'll talk about zoning and the economic development of this back area behind 230 Ash Street, which would include the Barbus building area that we pay an annual rental fee uh, to utilize for um, inventory um, part of the budget is the um, uh, usage study of our facilities which would include this building along with the operations building um, and part of that study will include an appraisal of this building station one and the in the um, the operations building uh, as we um, determine what's the best usage of these buildings uh, and we will also be getting an appraisal of the Barvis building area so that the, those um, parameters uh, uh, could be inputted into the study. Is there any questions on that? I mean, I can report back after the meeting to, to let you know. Yeah, I guess just, uh, just for my clarification, Colleen, so is there, uh, from RMLD's perspective, is there any... Uh, Thoughts about what's the right thing to do? Is, is that is, is the plan that we'd like to continue with that arrangement, or is it the desire? I, I to just do think it? it's a it's a prudent for an organization uh, with buildings of these sizes, um, you know, that you're assessing um, their worth and keeping up with, uh, especially when you're when you're running into 1.5 million dollar upgrades of your HVAC system and yeah. your maintenance costs. Uh, the operations building hasn't been maintained, you know, hasn't been updated, if you will, in a long time. So it's time to t just take a look at the worth. Uh, we are spending about 200 and, what do we have here, $212,000 a year. That might be a little bit short. And rent um, mm -hmm. per facility uh, that was previously looked at for purchase. So it's just time again to look at the best usage of your of the properties uh, in a study format, and um, we just have to get those appraisals in order to be able to present something with um, you know that has some sure. to it. Well, what's the what's the utilization of the space? Is uh, I've been there, but not to really look at it. Oh, the Barbus? Yeah. Uh, it's the um, stock inventory. By the way, do we use? Is it fully? Used we we rent 66 percent of that building for for inventory. Okay, I I have was wondered if they, if we could just vacate it and store things in lower rent areas of I don't know Wilmington or um, uh, consolidate. Well, that's, that would be part of the usage study. That's that's one of the things they would look at. Is right in the scope of work. It says, okay, we rent this. Is it better to buy it? Is it better to vacate it? 
do we have too much stock? Should we should we only be renting ten percent of the space instead yep. of sixty six percent of the space? I mean, all of those types of questions would be answered in a typical um, facility usage study. Um, do you recall that when I toured it, there were a lot of things there that were sort of dead storage? I don't recall the details. Well, we we. Uh, you know, for security purposes, I want to get into a lot of what we store there, but transformers yeah. and things like that, yeah. a lot of the stuff is not kept outside because we have a minimal, I mean, this is a right of way and the end of the property is actually at the, at the end of the deck. We don't own beyond that. So all of our parking area is in where operations is. We have a minimal amount of inventory that can come outside when you, when you include all of the employee yeah. parking. Um, and yep. it's a pretty substantial system for four towns. So uh, we do have some uh, inventory at substations, correct? But that's limited as well. So we will look at those all those questions. Okay. Good. Anything else, Colleen? Uh, the second. Uh, any more questions on that? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll give you idea. an update on that uh, after the meeting, and, and as we proceed, um, we are continuing our interviews on the facilities manager position who would be in charge of that project. Uh, organizational reliability study, we touched on that a little bit earlier. I just wanted to let you know that under the career development and training aspect of the purchasing laws, we're able to continue with LIDOS to help perform uh, the next steps, which are the leadership assessment uh, and the support um, and generation of the new strategic plan and the development and support of change management uh, that goes along with um, you know, the to be vetted recommendations on the organizational restructuring. So um, under the, again, under training and career development, they're gonna continue to help us, which makes sense. I mean, they've, they've already interviewed everyone, yeah. they, know every, they know how we work. So we'll continue in that direction and I'll give you an update um, as we complete each piece of those phases. But um, I think we're thinking within six months, each there's about six, six mini phases to that to get through that. Good. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thanks. Uh, next up, uh, Jane uh, will do the power supply report. Yep. Um, in your in your packet was the reports for both March and April, I believe, or just March and April. Um, and I put together a few slides to summarize the April. So if you have any questions on the March, just let me know. Yep. Um, a while back, uh, we looked at our annual purchases over the last ten-year period, and I believe Commissioner Talbot had read something where. Um, Historically, energy use was declining, but peak usage was actually increasing. Right. Uh, so what I had one of my analysts do is take that same period over that 10-year oh, yeah. period and look at our peak usage um, over that period. And it kind of was going up in the early 2004, 5, 6 period. Then we had some decline through 2009, um, back up through 10 and 11, um, and it's gone down. Pretty much last year, our peak was a little over 157 megawatts. So it's a lot of that's probably weather dependent. Um, hot summer, you know, mild summer also is a, uh, an exceptionally hot one. Um, but we're, the hope is between the economy, uh, the efficiency programs, and the weather, we can maintain a lower peak because a lot of our capacity and transmission costs on the wholesale side are driven by our peak demand. So all of our efficiency programs are targeting the reduction of that. I have a quick question on that. Is, so this is the monthly peak or the annual? Sorry, Tom. This is the yeah. annual. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think the thing I read was that the day, the day's peak, is higher than the average, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, not just the month or the year, but just in general that four to five is is getting to be higher relative to the whole day. Okay. I don't know. If, I don't know, is that true here? I mean, in general, that that. We'd have to look at that. Um, yeah. uh, has always been like that. Um, but that that spread is growing. That's that's what okay. I read. Yeah. We'll have to look at that. Um, I, I misunderstood what the. No, I mean, it's fine. Because you're right. I mean, the, what, it could be the heat wave this year and it doesn't right. happen next year, right? Um, the second graph that we looked um, where we're talking about a, a decrease or a flat sales, uh, we looked at basically the same 10 year period, 2004 through 2014, and we looked at our residential customers, which is uh, in blue on this chart. Um, it was just a little below 250 million kilowatt hours a year in, in 2004, and it's right out about at 250. So there's been a marginal increase in our residential sales. Uh, now, and if you look at the non-residential, which would include our commercial, industrial, time of use, and our municipal rates, um, as well as our street lights, that 
started around 450 and it's a little, um, looks like it's around 420, you know, 410 to 415. So there's been a decrease in our commercial sales um, with an overall decrease around 1%. So that, I just thought that would be interested in terms of looking at the different customer classes mm -hmm. and how it affects RMLD. Uh, this is just a typical slide that's included in your, uh, in your report, uh, energy by uh, resource. Uh, pretty typical for a shoulder month in April. Uh, our nuclear projects are still online. They typically take outages for refueling um, in October. Uh, so that's coming up, I think, in this uh, current calendar year for Seabrook. Um, and then our interchange was around a little, uh, right around 13%, which is pretty average. This next cost looks at RMLD's average energy costs over um, a three year period by month. So what I tried to address here. Um, is uh, particularly in January and February, as you can see, with the natural gas constraints that we're faced here in, with, here in New England, um, our costs have been rising or maintaining a, a high level around six cents, uh, if you look at the February period, um, from 2013 to 2015. Uh, when you look at March, it's kind of a swing month. It can be hot, it can be cold, not hot or cold. It's usually cold, but it might not be as, um, <coughs> winter conditions. Um, so in 2013, our costs were a little over four cents because of gas constraints that jumped up to just below six cents in 2014, and it was just a little over five cents in uh, 2015. And when you go to April, um, that tends to be a, a lower cost, uh, under five cents. And this particular month that we just closed on, um, those costs came in under three cents. One of the big driving factors for that um, ISO New England, based on their winter reliability requirement, is requiring uh, dual fuel generators uh, that can operate either on natural gas or oil to fill up their oil tanks. And because we have long-term contracts in the Stony Brook plant, which is located in Lumbo, Mass, as well as the Braintree Watson plant in Braintree, those uh, plant owners put in bids uh, to participate in that. And as a result of that, our share of that, RML, they received about $800,000 back. Wow. Um, so that was credited nice. in our April awesome. fuel charge. Um, but again, it's a pass through to all our customers. So our, our um, cost came in just under three cents. Again, we try to not spike our costs uh, in the winter period when prices tend to be in the six cents. We try to levelize that around five cents, and we've done a pretty good job over the last three years keeping that for our, our Any questions from the board? That's okay. Excellent. Good. Right. Thank you, Jane. Uh, so, Amid, uh, we'll do the engineering report, please. Thank you. On the first two pages, you see the financials, basically, on the capital improvements for up to date which brings the total up to $1,529,263. Uh, and the maintenance programs for the age overloaded transformer replacement program to April 30th, 2015. We've done about 13%. Uh, uh, the single phase Padmon transformer replacements, uh, about 8% on the three phase. For the overhead uh, single phase transformers, we replace approximately 10% and the three phase approximately 3.3%. For poll testing, uh, as you all know, we, 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 are, we have a program uh, in place that uh, every year annually, we, by law, we're supposed to test 10% of the polls that we own the system. This year, uh, last year, we tested about uh, 645 polls. Uh, out of those 390, they passed, three, 233, they failed. Out of the 233, 77 has been replaced. 22 polls were condemned, which all 22 uh, polls have been replaced. 30 out of the 99 transfers, they have been completed to date. So we're making progress on those. <coughs> uh, 13, 8 KV and 35 KV feeders, quarterly inspections. You have the list there. You know, we try to do quarterly so many uh, feeders. Uh, to make sure if there are any obvious signs of deteriorations or uh, failures that we can prevent. Uh, manhole inspection is pending. 
porcelain cutout replacements with the po uh, polymer, that's another uh, maintenance item that as of April 30th, there are 284 remaining porcelain cutouts to be replaced. And the crews, they're replacing the, which by up to date, by the way, they're 90% completed as we making upgrades uh, to the system and replacing and, and building new uh, circuits and extended circuits as part of that program, those uh, cutouts being replaced in the field. Uh, and the, the substation maintenance, the infrared scanning a monthly, uh, for the month of April, all three substations, they were normal. We didn't find any hot spots. And the uh, substation maintenance program, you know, we have uh, completed the, uh, into the testing all th three substations 100%. There's some minor uh, issues that we found that, you know, we are going through that list and trying to fix them. The system reliability report, uh, the, the three indices, uh, system average interruption duration index, system average interruption frequency index, and uh, the customer average interruption duration index, they're all well below national and uh, regional average uh, for uh, the month of, for the year in 2015, year to date. Uh, <coughs> Under uh, the last page of the report on page six, you see the outage causes for the calendar year to date. And uh, the outage causes, uh, the, the overall annual averages for, from 2010 to 2015. The highest been for 37% of the equipment failure, 23% uh, of the wildlife, and 28% uh, tree-related uh, failures. Uh, this has been the highest basically for the month for up to, year, up to 2015. Any questions? No. We're good? It looks yeah, good. good. All right. Great. Yeah, good. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Good report. Nice graphics, though. Yes. I like the. the uh, oh, yeah, that this graph you like? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. Good. Uh, Bob will do the financial report. Uh, um, excuse me. I yes. think we have a presentation. Oh, uh, oh we do. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Welcome. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner. Yes. Gino. We're going to have a fiber yeah. optic presentation. Yeah, Mr. Price. Thank you, Colleen. Good evening. If you, for those who don't know me, I'm Peter Price. I'm chief engineer. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? Good. Good. It's more of a discussion than a presentation. I don't have any slides or anything sure. like that. Okay, good. For certain reasons. So let me give you a little history of the uh, fiber optics of when it's at and where we're at. Back in the 1980s, the RMLD uh, decided to install a SCADA system. SCADA system is a supervisory control and data acquisition system that gives the control center operator uh, remote control and indication of the substations. When this was first installed, the method, the means of communication was the use of leased phone lines from uh, Ninex. <coughs> Excuse me. Over the years, the cost of those lease lines and the reliability, cost went up and the reliability went down. So in, I believe it was in the end of late 1993, the RMLB formed a task force. And the task force was a fiber optic task force and it was, uh, it was made up of Dave Sweeter, he was a co-chair, as well as Kyle Benson, who was a lineman. And there was a member, Danny, Danny Merritt, who was the control center uh, manager, and there was uh, a gentleman by the name, I think his name was Carl Fleischer from FMS Telecommunications as the consultant. What they, uh, and I don't know the whole process they went through, you know, it was just, uh, I'd only been here a couple years when that all went through. But what it was, what the recommendation came out to be is that the RMLD would install a fiber optic network to loop all the substations and certain, certain switching points around our system. It was a 72 fiber, six tubes of 12, and the lineman, the Reading Light lineman installed the fiber. Uh, they used a contractor to do all the splicing and terminating at each of the substations. <coughs> Out of that 72 uh, fibers we have, and six tubes, we've dedicated two tubes just for Reading Light Department that left four tubes of 48 fibers that we weren't using as dark fiber. 
a quick question on that. The two tubes, so you have uh, 24 strands just for RMLD? Yes. That's, I mean, that's a lot, right? I mean, do you, is that all used? Uh, no, it's not all used, but um, it's one set of, one tube is for just direct connection to the substation. Right. One tube is being used for connections to the substation as well as remote points, nodes for the uh, AMI system in different locations. But I guess all I'm saying is even just within those two tubes, you, there's a lot of capacity. Yes. Yeah. So even leaving aside the stuff that's being leased, there's still more that's not being used, basically. There's a, a, there's a few, yeah, there's a few fibers that we're not using. So oh, uh, in 2007, uh, when Pete Dion here, was here as the e &O manager, they uh, dealt with NISCOM, some type of, uh, Pete had some type of uh, communication with NISCOM. And what happened is they developed a, uh, a lease by tying fiber, uh, let me back up for a second, uh, fiber loops around the system. It goes through all four towns. Uh, what they decided to do was entering into an agreement with NISCOM to lease out some of that dark fiber. In order to do that, they had to make a connection on the uh, south side of the loop down by Industrial Way and Woman Street, and they had another tie point in North Reading <coughs> up by Low Road, Main Street. So they entered into an agreement. It, it was called an IRU, an indisputable right of use. Uh, I believe Deidre Lawrenson from Rubin and Rudman was involved with the creation of this document and they spelled out a lease for us to be able to lease stock fiber to this company, uh, NISCOM. At first, the leases involved just straight pass-throughs. They brought in a 144 fiber cable, or 288, whatever it was at the time, into a fiber so that they could lease out 48 fibers in one direction around the west side of the loop, or they could lease out 48 fibers around the east side of the loop and get through our system, out through North Reading, and into Andover. <coughs> Can I ask a question about that? Yep. Um, so at this, I mean, I, I don't think any, any of us on the board, and I may be wrong, understands enough about this to know whether, what, you know, to know much about how, what's a good deal in a lease or not, or what's the right type of contract to get into. So I'm wondering at that juncture, did, was there any third party that looked at this, like a consultant that was working for us that knows these kinds of deals for other utilities, other munis? and it had some expertise to help us get the best deal at that time? I wasn't involved with that at the time. It was uh, Pete Dylan, so he had some knowledge when he came from uh, NSTAR. He had some knowledge of uh, right. fiber and leases. I don't want to speak out of turn, but yeah, I, yeah. Didn't have, I don't have, I'm not privy to that information. Well, I would think that if, if Ruben and Rudman was involved and uh, in the telecom industry, they have to be able to attach, right. whether it's their attachment or our attachment, and we're looking into that. But I believe, you know, based on the safety and capacity of the pole, we have to allow them attached. So if they come in and they request it, I don't think you have to go out and solicit. Um, but I'm sure if Ruben and Rudman drafted up the contract, it was probably compared sure. in cost to anybody else who was leasing out dock fiber. And just because you had asked that question not too long ago, Peter uh, called a bunch of the companies that let the municipals that lease out dock fiber. It was municipals and private companies, right? I and, didn't get a lot of feedback, but from uh, Phoenix said that was right in line. I yeah, think we got. I, would you get five or six different prices, and we were right. In, we were right there with the price per mile that yeah, we the were. The costs fluctuate a little bit because it depends on how much infrastructure they provided as opposed yeah. to who provided it. So, mm -hmm. but he assured me the costs were right in line with. What yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I, I would expect that everybody's acting in good faith and, and that these are good deals. But I still feel like there should be a set of independent eyeballs, even, and the lawyers do great jobs drafting contracts, but that we probably need some expertise looking at these contracts and maybe a presentation to the board before we enter into any big significant new ones. It would just be my gut feeling. I could be wrong. I don't think anyone disagrees yeah. with you at all. And also at that time, I mean, it really depends on whether it's single mode fiber or multi mode. I mean, multi mode is more, much more bandwidth limited than single mode, mode right. fiber. Uh, and even the single mode today has uh, orders of magnitude more capacity right. than the fine single mode back then. So I don't know, if, do you happen to know, Peter, whether it's single mode or multi mode? Yeah, single, single mode. It is yeah. single mode. So it's got really great capacity, you know, uh, 
far more than we could ever use it for. Right. Uh, so. The contracts are three years. They they continue every three years, correct? In the different. Yes, there's an initial term in each IRU, and they the they range from three to five years. Mo most of them are three years, and uh, there's a fixed price for the first three years, and then after the third year, there's a formula to adjust the the price based on the CPI index and things like that. And Bob knows that uh, that equation um, there, and those get adjusted as those terms expire and they renew their leases. Uh, we, so there's a number of IRUs, right, with light, yes. light tower, correct? And there are nine in place right now and three that are uh, in being Q. developed. In the in Q. Q. Right. So those are still in the loop because only five miles goes through Reading. So you're talking about a loop that goes through all four towns. But the ones that are in a queue, um, because this is, you know, part of a business that they've been, that we are operating out of our electric fiber, so even the money financially goes into the electric business. Um, Which is interesting, the, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because it's electric; it's an electric fiber loop. Oh, I see. Because so it was paid for by ratepayers for right. electric purposes. Then any leasing correct. goes back to the ratepayer. Got correct. it. Got it. But uh, even the ones in queue. Uh, we're looking at a half a million dollars a year in revenue. Yes, is a. And and I'm assuming that when you say no large projects, that we're talking about the potential one that was going to be built through the middle, and not the continuation of these strands that that we're already that we're already on in queue, correct? Because I, I um, have to think about that. I guess I'm just saying I feel like these deals should probably come. At some level, through the board, and Jean shaking, shaking her head. I imagine the IRU was approved uh, with the board. I mean, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I imagine something like that would have had to have been approved by the board. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it was. I do remember the IRU. The IRU. Okay. <laughs> good. I mean, in a we way, have a good historical yeah. perspective yeah. here. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Bill approved it. We yeah. discussed that at some point. That's great. It um, was a good deal at the time, right? <laughs> yes. So we have nine uh, leases in force right now. We have three pending agreements that are in queue. We're working on one project right now that's a four-mile expansion of fiber in North Reading, a lateral. And now whenever we expand the fiber, it's not done with ratepayer money. The contractor provides materials, provides uh, money for, uh, for our line crews and engineering to do framing and design, and they install the fiber and do the splicing. So, so we don't make any expenditure from the uh, light department to uh, to get into these uh, these lateral build outs. And, the owners can take the right. and, and the at the end, we own it. Our it's our property. Mm -hmm. So I guess but the, at a high level, we have companies using our poles and infrastructure and our facilities to run a very profitable, profitable business for themselves, which is just to be aware that the board should be aware that this is going on. And maybe we should be aware of what our opportunity is directly more so than we have been historically. You know, what could RMLD itself do that now these other companies are doing for themselves and obviously making good money at it, or they wouldn't be doing it? They have large networks. I mean, we're 25, 26 miles. I mean, they're talking hundreds, you know, maybe thousands of miles, and they're, they're aggregating different uh, networks okay. to get these deals. And I mean, yeah, no, no, I don't see how somebody, you know, a utility like us could go out there and try to network with Metro mm -hmm. PCS when we can only offer them five miles of fiber and Reading. Or, sure. That's a know. good point. You're making a good point. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, I'm not trying to talk out anything. Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, these no, are no, things no. that we see that. Yeah, know. I mean, I think it's my, where I would sort of land is I think, you know, Dave makes some interesting points that I think we're, we all share, you know, overall concern about, but I think we're still relatively new uh, for us, maybe a report out periodically on what's happening like tonight is a good starting point sure so because we don't I don't think we have enough knowledge to, to, to make any definitive changes or decisions or inter interrupt necessarily the flow of commerce but true and, and in, indirectly I mean if the businesses that are getting the advantage of the fiber are within the four towns and we actually are helping that sure. economic development of towns that's right I mean, well, I'll throw one more thought into the mix so um, by the way on July 8th there's a, we sent an invitation out today we're doing a little event to have MLPs learn from other MLPs about this whole business at Harvard Law School. So I'll send one to you, or Colleen, oh. and hopefully you can come. 
one one thing that can be done is when a, a job like that's being done, have them put up more fiber than they're putting up for their own purposes. Then you have it up there if you ever need it in the future. We have a minimum of 36 that we ask for. Yeah. Uh, in this, this venture in North Reading, once that's in and completed, we're going to grab some of that fiber to help us with our AMI and distribution automation projects. So for communications out in an area yeah. where we don't have communications right now. So that's a great idea and a great thing to do. I'm saying go 10x more than that or 5x. I'll give you an example from Holyoke because this is one I've been had my head in for a couple months now. They had a data center go in and the data center actually hired Holyoke to put the fiber connection it wasn't, it wasn't the Holyoke's fiber. They said, we need you to run this fiber from Chicopee into this data center. So Holyoke Gas and Electric was just the con basically the contractor throwing up the fiber uh, for this data center. Well, when they did it, they did literally put 10x more fiber up than was needed for the data center. The incremental cost was nothing, pennies per foot. But now Holyoke Gas and Electric's telco division has whatever it is, 20 miles of extra fiber like I don't know hundred and some odd strands extra mm -hmm. that it cost them a few thousand to put in because they were already up and the trucks were already rolling they were already hanging fiber and they put up 10x more sure. um, I think the data center I remember the numbers are now coming back to me the data center needed 12 strands they put up 144 strands that sounds now right. they have uh, now they have 132 to use for whatever leasing whatever other municipal applications so when you have these chances, it really is sensible that everybody needs more data. People are going to need to lease more in the future. We might have applications for it in the future. Put way more than you're even the extra you're thinking about now is what I see other people doing. And we'll approach them on that when, yeah. they, uh, when they make a, uh, a request for us. We can do right. that. Every time you're building some, put way more than you think you, you, you They may look for us to make a contribution if it goes course. above a certain size. Oh, yeah, no, you, you, know, you, pay this, you pay the extra materials out of the department's pocket, and it's not going to be much, but mm -hmm. it's there. for. It's a good investment for the future. No, I agree. That's all. It doesn't cost you much. Okay. So with all the leases uh, we're looking at is the nine leases in force, the three that are pending, the one I mentioned in North Reading, and we've given quotes on seven other projects. Um, we could be looking at a potential revenue of uh, pro over half a million dollars annually with all these uh, leases. That's very, very exciting. You know? Yeah. So, and it just kind of shows you where the growth area is, right? For It's not an electricity sales necessarily. And I think one of them, uh, there's, there's one that we estimated out for 24 fibers. It may be that da a data center. They've chosen to go another path, and um, I think that's part of it. They don't like to tip their hand too much mm -hmm. uh, because of the competition that's out there. They know there's other networks. Other people are providing prices to provide these same uh, data paths. So, well, hmm. great. Good. That's all I have. Any other questions? Or? Nice, nice presentation. Thank you, yeah, thank thank you, you thank very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <coughs> why don't we do the financial report then? Phil will swing back. We uh, saved you uh, the cost payable warrant okay. uh, item for a special introduction of you. Okay. Hello. Oh, thanks, Bob. Okay. Tonight uh, I'll be sh presenting the uh, April 30th uh, financial report. Uh, we represent the first 10 months of uh, FY15. So looking at page 3A, uh, page 3, the change in net assets for the month of April was showing a net profit, a positive change in net assets of about $666,000, which increases our year-to-date net income to about $2.6 million. We had budgeted uh, net income for this period at $2.4 million, which results in net income uh, being over budget by about $146,000 or 6%. The actual year-to-date fuel revenues exceeded fuel expenses by $427,000, and the purchase power capacity and transmission revenues exceeded the expenses by about $355,000. Now looking at page 3A on the uh, revenue side, year-to-date base revenues are under budget by about $375,000 or 2%. The actual base revenues came in at $18.1 million, compared to our budgeted amount of $18.5 million. On the expense side, page 12A, year-to-date purchase power base expense was over budget by $771,000, or about 3.2%. 
The actual purchase power base cost came in at 24.3 million versus the budgeted power cost of about 23.6 million. On the operating and maintenance side, combined those expenses were over budget by $59,000 um, or about half of 1%. The actual O&M expenses were at 11.8 million while the budget expenses came in at 11.7 million. Depreciation expense and the voluntary payments to the towns are on budget and those uh, will be made uh, next month in June to the four towns. Looking at cash on page nine, the operating funds at 10.5 million, capital fund balances at 5.8 million, rate stabilization 6.6 .6 million, 6.7 million, deferred fuel 4.5 million, and the energy conservation fund is at $590,000. On the general information side, on page five, the year-to-date kilowatt hour sales came in at 580 million, which is about 3.7 million or about a little more than a half or one percent behind last year's actual figure. Also on the general information side, um, last November we were contacted by the uh, Commonwealth of Mass Sales Tax Division. Mm -hmm. They do this every, you get, if you're lucky enough, you get randomly selected to go through a sales tax audit. Mm -hmm. So they came in uh, November, we set it up with them. Uh, they just left this past April. Uh, they audited the period from April 12th through September 14th, and so that's about 30 month period. And what they do is, is they uh, audit your monthly reportings and also to make sure that your documentation is correct. So the monthly reporting, you will see on the accounts payable warrant, you'll see the report and the payment that we make to the Commonwealth of Mass. And the documentation is what customer service does when a commercial account, and sales tax only applies to commercial accounts, residentials are tax exempt. Uh, so they come in and they check all your documentation on your commercial accounts and make sure you have an exempt certificate if, you are, if your commercial accounts are not paying sales tax. At the end of the day, um, you got a clean bill of health, which means there's no interest, no penalty costs. Um, because the paperwork was, was fine, we didn't have to pay any additional sales tax that might have been overlooked, so uh, it didn't cost the, the rate payers a, a, a cent on this year. Excuse, so excuse me, but do they, do they tell you when you overpaid as well? <laughs> <laughs> no, we have 3, I think the accounts. clean bill of health might have been. <laughs> we have 3,000 commercial accounts, and she went through every, every draw we had and verified those accounts. Hmm. Um, I just want to thank customer service for getting all the documentation, but especially Maureen Hannafin, the customer services manager. She spearheaded the audit when they came out here, yeah. and she applied all the assistance, and uh, they were quite pleased with the help that we gave them and how good our records were kept. So uh, th 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 this, I talked to my friends who go through the same thing in private and in public. It's going to be a horror show. Yes. And uh, we not That's know. great. Excellent. Congratulations. Congratulations. Well, that's, that's more than in her group, customer service. I just want to make sure they get that right out. Now with one of my clients. <laughs> yes. And it turns out the, the, uh, they claim they were exempt from the Cuban Municipal Light, even though they're not a manufacturer. And I said, who filed that form? <laughs> <laughs> and one other note, too, uh, I've been talking to our auditors, and I got some preliminary uh, dates for the upcoming audit. Uh, they'll be coming out June 22 and June 23 to do some preliminary field work, basically test some AP invoices, payroll records, journal entries, just to get some of that field work out of the way. The RMLD will be doing its physical inventory count the last weekend in June, June 27, 28. I think the truck's going to be done that Monday. Um, and the actual audit itself is scheduled for the week of August 10th. And the last point uh, on the budget variance on the uh, April financials, cumulatively the five divisions are over budget by $25,000 or a little more than one-tenth of one percent. That's my report. Oh. Thank you. Yep. I'm trying to get into the graph, like my esteemed colleagues over here. <laughs> yes. It's numbers. It's, I'm not uh. sure what the, I, I'll take any suggestions that the uh, board would like to, if there's anything they want to see graphed. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Well, all I'm showing here is just a trend for the last uh, five fiscal years. I'm just showing the operating uh, expenses, uh, how they're progressing up, how the maintenance expenses are also progressing up, but not as steeply as. Uh, uh, the operating side, and the only reason why it dipped back then uh, at the beginning is because we had the gospel remediation expense costs going through. But you can just see the trend, like everything else, costs are going up, hence uh, 
If there's anything special that the uh, board would like to see as far as graft or whatever, I, I am open to suggestions. Yeah, thank you. I, I, we may, we may uh, participate in that. And, and what I'm mostly interested in with the graphs is sort of what's the, what's the implication behind the, the numbers, right? In terms of when you see something going down, like a maintenance expense going down, it implies maybe we didn't spend as much time at that point in uh, history looking doing maintenance expenses, and you tend to suffer from not doing those. I mean, it's a short-term gain perhaps in uh, in bottom line money but in long term you're you're hurting yourself and I think that's what we found um, the operating right. budget increasing I can understand that just because we're a fixed cost organization and there are thir certain uh, labor contracts for example as we mentioned that are pre-negotiated and those go up every year you know, just like they do in every business uh, with a, a uh, consumer price index or something that's uh, appropriate like that mm -hmm. So that, that's what I would be interested in, Bob, is, is when you plot the data, then you go, well, what does this mean and what can we expect? And I think you've incorporated that into the six-year projection, so that's, that's great. Yep. That was a good comment. Any other comments from Bob? Okay. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll swing back, uh, back to, me. Swing back to uh, Phil. Phil's going to report on... Uh, yeah, just... Those pay the warrant and sale prices. You know, we all get Jeannie's report that, you know, the exceptions, and we, there are no exceptions. And I'm wondering whether there's a better way to handle that in terms of signing of the warrant. And Jeannie says there's no exceptions. And I also wonder if there's a way to do the approval of, I wouldn't do the approval of the payroll, but for the approval of the warrant by electronically. Where instead of a, somebody coming down here on the weekend, it's done electronically. The payroll one? The payroll one I wouldn't do because that, you know, payroll information is really sensitive. Yep. All right. And even, even if you read the, well, the, public, the, the IRS got breached this week, mm -hmm. you know? But those so. are public Those are public salaries, though. Well, I know, but, you know, I, that's public. In, it's information, too. There may, there may be some personal information of the individual involved in that. So I, I, I'd be very leery of the payroll. Yeah. I'd be I, very leery of the payroll the electronically. But I think the warrant. Well, let me, let me make a comment, if I might, on, yeah. the, on the payroll one. Uh, and well, I think we started to try this um, maybe two years ago or so, where you can, I think you can combine everything on one or two pages uh, with all the financial data per the person there. And when you look, glance at it, you can see anything that sort of jumps out as an exception. And you can question it, like whether it's overtime or extra pay or anything else, as opposed to these very thick sheets that we have to go through. And you just lose your way. I mean, you just... You know, th th there's just so many of them uh, to be able to go through. So I'd like to recommend that maybe we come up with just a format uh, to talk to that. And, uh, and, Bob, I could talk to you about, you know, sort of how to do it because I thought the initial one we tried was actually quite good. We just didn't stick with it. And it's really just an Excel derivation. So uh, that's this on that. But on, on the other one, I, I agree. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if there's a way to do it, you know, that we would, instead of, you know, I mean, I've lived close enough that I could walk over it. The accounts payable one? The accounts payable one. But there's a way to do that electronically. But it sounds like that would be a, I mean, then they have to scan all these different stuff. It's going to be know. a. I don't know. There's got to be. I don't, I mean, I, per, I, I take your point. I personally don't mind it. Um, mm -hmm. I understand the, what you're saying, but I don't mind stuff. Yeah, so, it. I mean, I think there's two, I think we all agree there's an oversight piece that we need to do right. uh, to uh, make sure that uh, there's no omissions or commissions. Uh, right. but, the, but the thing is, I mean, we're not coming up with any, with any omissions or, or anything that's going to, you know, I can't, I don't think any of us pulled a, a, a warrant out and said, don't pay this. No, but I think we've flagged I don't flagged think we've done th that. Well, I think we've flagged some things that. Yeah, well, we, we flag it as questions, that the department answers questions. Sure. And I just wonder is a better way to get the questions so done. With the, perhaps I can make a suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know if this would work or not, but uh, again, well, many of the, the uh, accounts payable are historical in nature. I mean, they occur every month. So why not just have a history of those for the last 12 months with the present months on an Excel spreadsheet so you can look at it and go, yeah, this is in line with the last 12 months. So and it's been approved by at least three people here, maybe four that have stamped it. So I agree with you, Phil. It's, a, it's a, having another set of eyes to look at it is fine unless you don't know what you're looking at and you don't know what the trend is. So if you found that the telephone bill went from you know, $50 or $50,000 to $100,000, you'd go, oh, what happened there? And then you could actually go to the sheet and, and find it. But you could do that in literally five minutes, looking at a, at a summary sheet, basically, of all of that. And I think 
you probably have everything entered electronically in the system, so it could be almost filled out automatically. So you'd have two pages, you look at, you look for exceptions, which is what we're talking about, or something other down below the bottom, below the standard li line. And I think we could, uh, I don't know, it depends on how much work this would be to put together. See, I don't, I, I look at this as a, because it's an Excel spreadsheet and you've got all the data, it's just really just filling out the form. Once you do it, it's populated pretty quickly. But yeah, I think one it's question different. is, I don't know, what, what's the repeat vendor list? Is it 80% of the same vendors every month? I'm trying to remember. No, I, I, I think like the John's one, if you see the same vendors, you say, okay, uh, home bill should be two grand every month. That's income, 13 grand. Right. What the heck happened? Because you just see the one month, 13, I don't remember. You, you don't remember last month. Right, right. 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 You can see the trend and say, okay, this, is, this right. makes sense. Um, it would be a manual process, but I think You know, but I don't see that, you know, and this is my philosophy. I don't see it our job to go and see that Colleen signed off or somebody signed off. I don't see that as our job. I see it our job as looking for anything that's exceptionally or anything that we see out of line. Yeah. And that's how I've always kind of treated the signing of the warrant. Now, I have other commissioners have had different thoughts. God bless Mr. Sully. When he was here, he always checked the sign-offs. <laughs> yeah. yes. And made sure that everybody signed off and made a point when somebody didn't sign off on something. Um, can I uh, pipe in? Please. Yes. Sure. Yeah. I just don't think you can set up a spreadsheet to. I don't see duplicate. I mean, even if you're looking at tree trimming, it's going to be different crews in different areas and different police details. The only thing that I can see that you'd have a trend is your phone bill because it's something different every month. And a lot of times I have to go through the backup sheets in order to figure out exactly what it is that they're buying and why they needed it and it's not always clear right on the cover to me. So um, I think the process is more like just another set of eyes as opposed to, um, you know, setting up a trend would be really difficult, I think. A couple of you mentioned phone bills. As you know, I circulated a memo about phone bills. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> you guys brought it up. Um, That's all right. That's fine. Well, I mean, yeah, okay, so it's two grand a month, two grand a month, it looks normal. But actually seeing the bill, realizing, gee, we're spending $100 per phone call, that looks like something from the, from the 80s. And I think I might have found something that we can fix uh, with different plans uh, or maybe voice over IP in the future because we're paying ridiculous per minute rates for calls to Hartford. So to my, maybe I'm wrong, but I think there was a value there when I saw something and that maybe that will get changed at some point. Right, and I think my email to you is that we, we come under the town's long distance. Sure, no, no, no. But then the town, well, whoever it is, it's like, well, you know, sometimes we notice stuff and maybe it's valuable, you know, and it's because we had it in front of us, yeah. you know, yeah. and we wouldn't have seen it otherwise. I think it would actually be cheaper if I got everybody to use their cell phone to make their calls and their conference right, calls. Right, because it's free. Sure. I mean, you know, but so is landline calls are free at my house, but so anyway, but that's a drill down, but um, well, if the, on, in this AP, you'll see that we had to go buy a Skype credit, a uh, little credit voucher huh? in order to come back and then log into Skype for a conference call that was being run on Skype, which is great. So it probably would cost you 10 bucks or something for a Skype credit. Yeah, but it's just, you gotta, you gotta drive to Staples to buy a Skype credit in, you yeah. know, like to drive to Staples to get us anyway. It's like an iTunes gift. You get like yeah. Uh, you just do it on Skype. But I, well, you know, but then you have to set up an account, a uh, credit card, and we don't have one of them. Remember? Well, we do. We have a little one. We just heard about how we yeah, spend three hundred thousand dollars on credit card fees. No, not that. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. That's for your fees. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Right. That's your fees. Yeah, we paid it. We paid it. Right. Yeah. Oh gosh. <laughs> well. I don't know. I take your point. I think if we if we choose to put our eyeballs on these bills, we occasionally will find stuff. Okay. And believe me, I would love to streamline that, but unfortunately, I just don't think that there's what payroll. Yes, but the AP is just okay. it's it's not the same every week. It's it's 
just there's no there's no way to make it go quicker. Okay. I've thought about it. I've lost sleep over it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a good discussion. Uh, it doesn't have yeah, to be resolved today. You know, yep. see whether we're still accomplishing what we're trying to do. Yep. You know. So I, I, th I think it's something we those sort of things we should revisit because I, I think what we really want is to make sure what we're doing is value added, and I, I think it's unclear. You know, on any individual uh, sign off, it's sometimes it may feel like a road exercise. Sometimes you may, you know, but I guess the very fact that it, there's a review process, you know, that uh, provides uh, you know some oversight and governance to the process. So. I would say uh, let's also let the staff take a look, Colleen. You've obviously th thought about it, and I'm guessing Jean's probably has a thought or two. We can have additional discussion uh, during the course of the year if there's some other recommendations that people have. If I may, um, yep. what about uh, just putting uh, on a scale limit? In other words, items that are over $500 we look at, as opposed to you know, someone buying a pair of boots or gloves. I mean, you know, that they do that on a routine basis. And then, we see it, the sign-offs, but it's still flipping through quite a few papers to kind of do that. Why not just look at the major items, which is really what we're more talking about here, I think, in terms of strategic buys, uh, and where we would have real questions, because the rest of it, I, you know, it's operational, and we trust, every, obviously, everybody in the department to do the right thing, and people are making those decisions every day. And I'm not even sure those need three or four signatures, but apparently they do. How much of the approval process is connected to, to the town? So, uh, so are, are we within, is it within our jurisdiction if we wanted to do what John said, you know, decide on, you know, like a lot of companies, you know, businesses, you'd uh, only require certain sign-offs for items over a certain dollar value. So if we change that, does that impact the process as it flows to town or? But I mean, their expectation is that it has. Their expectation is he's gone through every one of them or whatever, but. Yeah, uh, but I mean, they're expecting that a board commissioner signed it as well as uh, the general manager or someone filling in for the general manager and the, 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 the department involved. Right, I mean, when you think about it, the whole process, how many hands touch it and how many uh, uh, approvals there are. I mean, the employee submits it, it, it goes to the manager, right, it goes to uh, the division manager, it goes to I guess my real question is how much of the approval process is uh, influenced or dictated by the town versus our own internal process? I think, uh, I mean, still going to say, I think some some board, no, no GM signature, I mean, they, they, they check, they got the I's and cross the T's, all the ones that said, hey, the department uh, is trustworthy, uh, they're efficient. Yeah. I, I'm going to come in and just cross check some of the bigger items it's and call them. It's, I think it's in our policy statement that there are, it used to be three uh, commissioners, and we reduced it two yeah. years ago to one. Right. And I th once again, it's a policy statement. We can change the policy. Right. So maybe we address that in our policy committee. I think that's a good idea to take a look at it. Yeah, we're having a meeting. Yeah, yeah. why don't we have some further discussion? I, I guess I'd also ask uh, Colleen for you to think about uh, you know, because there's two sides to this. You know, what the, the whether the board perceives it to be of a, a sufficient value or not, but also, you know, your comfortability with you know whether it adds value or helps to have that additional level. Because that, if it does, from your perspective, then that's a, to me a compelling reason not to make a mm -hmm. any significant well, change. I, I think it. Uh, this is not going to be a popular answer, maybe, but. Um, when you go through these things, I think you get a better sense of, uh, even though it's operational, but the business. Yep. And um, yep. I think a lot of the topics that we talk about that maybe it might ring a bell in your head because you looked at AP and you're familiar with some of the things that we're doing. Yeah. Because um, you know, you're not in the business every single day, but you have to learn the business in order to, you know, to to talk to me and to talk to staff and understand what we're saying so that you, you trust 
that our strategies and what we're doing operationally will move, we'll move ahead are are within what we consider to be reasonable and prudent for running this business. So I think it helps from that perspective. Um, I mean, I still learn a lot when I'm looking at the AP, yep. you know, and um, amazed at how much more I can keep yep. learning, but I don't know, that's just I my two cents. A yeah. question, so the bills aren't paid until we sign it. So we've, we've requested the service, whatever it is, or bought something, and then we sign and then we pay it. Is that the way the process is? Some of the larger items you've already voted on because they might be a bid and maybe we're just getting a portion of the transformers in and then we pay for them, we right. would pay for them. Uh, we basically signed a contract saying, you know, this is what we would pay for them, but the actual check is not cut until after you sign it and it goes to the town hall. Correct, Bob? Right, so the only ones that uh, may not apply a little wider payments because of the nature of the time that you want to incur late charges. Some of those will get paid before the bills are warrant. The town understands all that. We're not kidding. You might get the invoice late, and so you get them the warrant, and they're aware of it already. Plus, we give them all the backup so they can make a wire payment on time. Um, and right, if the, the town will not pay the, the AP invoice until it's signed off uh, by the board, and it's a 11 day lag. So it's worth sending back to the mill by the board. The only, the only thing that I want to add is I know Bob, Jane, and I have lived through the ills. Apparently some of the ills re resulted from some of the, the invoice, the, the warrants being signed that had, had things that were inappropriate. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, the three of us sure. have lived through that time. I don't want to live through that time again. Sure. Yeah. And I'm sure at this point you, you, nobody wants to live through that time again. <laughs> yeah. So that's a, an argument in favor of the... Right. I mean, it's just I wonder if there's a way that if we could do it electronically, it would be so much easier, but, you know, electronically, I mean, as opposed to having all that paper. Yeah. Well, you know, we'll send it up to the, the town electronically at that point, too, if there's a way to just combine that process. You know, one thing it, it seems to me that would be helpful is, uh, I probably don't think it exists, if there was a secured site that board members could get on that doesn't have access to all of our MLD's information, but you know, like a SharePoint site that's protected, you know, uh, that you could sign on, that you'd have access to board materials. You, you could put on a, over time, if, as you become more electronic, you could put on a, you know, a payables warrant and uh, it would be secured and you could, op so you could handle that. But I, I don't think that exists today. Well, we're working on it. Yeah. We actually have a SharePoint that we made a secure site for Lidos and Booth and that's oh. there. Yeah, so as far as the payable, because a lot of the sheets yeah. are five, six, seven stapled together, so right. you're talking about that yeah. manual of unstapling them, yeah. scanning them in, restapling them, because they have to pay the yeah. town hall off the original invoice. Yeah. So it's just more of a... Yeah, I guess I'd be interested in, uh, it, it sounds like the technology is available now, I think from the board's perspective, uh, having that level of automation, because... Uh, I think it would cut down maybe some of the work that Gene has to do as well in, in terms of... Uh, Why would we want to do that? Yeah, but you know what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of information that, uh, you know, we have available on the iPad, but it's, uh, you know, once we leave here, you know, you, you'd be able to access it remotely and, and, and so I think well, we can set up. I'll talk to Mark about the SharePoint and um, the Zoom link in here, right? Okay. The board packet. Um, I'll talk to Mark about the setting up a, yeah. a, a share the SharePoint for your access. I mean, we're getting there. We're, we're starting to build. Yeah, it's not a, it's not an urgent like item. I just think that that might. Uh, I, I think that might be easier than. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, so, so for example, uh, what we just went through. So when. You know, when Lidos does a, a you know a 100-page report, you know right now there, there's limited options. Uh, you know, you can send us a link, but if there was a, a site, I just think over time it becomes easy to right. find, you know, information relative to the board meetings and and things of that sort. But okay, but I think it's a good discussion. Great. Okay, thank you, Phil, for that. Uh, all right, so uh, we have. Uh, I mean, did you want to, we have some bids that we have to look at. Are you going to introduce or give any background or? Yeah, on this is uh, item 11 on our agenda for the MGL chapter 30 bids. Yeah. Do you want us to go right into motions? I didn't know if you were providing background 
or just uh, one, the motion. Motion. why don't we do the mo motion, okay. motion and then uh, yeah, all right background. thank you Meet. <laughs> uh, okay so uh phil i think you're on deck okay move that bid 2015-23 for electric utility excavation including emergency excavation and construction services be awarded to zim zinelli i hope i pronounced that right Ex uh, excavation llc for $39,583 and two cents as the lowest qualified bid in the recommendation of the general manager. Second. 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 Now you can get a background. <laughs> okay. uh, Ami, did you have some background on that? On uh, the excavation, uh, no. Yeah, Zanelli. Zanelli is the your successful bidder. For the project in Linfield. Yeah, for uh, the pr project in Linfield is one of them. But we got other construction projects that we need contractor. If we get right then going, you know, on request for code, we're gonna go for the bid so we have them and we're gonna uh, renew that annually. Mm. Okay. All right. Uh, discussion? Okay. None appearing. Uh, take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. Mm. Motion carries 5 0. Move the Thank bid 2015 25 for. Residential energy audits be awarded to Healthy Home Energy LLC as the lowest responsible and responsible bidder for a three year period of total cost of $185,625 in the recommendation general manager. Okay, can we have a second? Second. Okay. Any uh, background, Amit? No, that would be me. Oh, That's Jane. Okay. Sorry, okay. I snuck up here while you weren't looking, Tom. Okay. Um, we received two bids on this one from Green Tap Energy. Um, and the other one was Healthy Homes. Uh, the bids, if you looked at the backup over the three-year period, were worth less than $5,000 $5, apart. Um, the actual bids came in lower than what the current vendor that we have. That uh, contract expires on June 30th. So currently, uh, we're paying $200 per audit for a residential audit. Um, and this bid, um, the successful bidder was at $175. Um, historically, over the three-year period of the current auditor um, to date, uh, we've spent about 198000 So that line item, or well, not a line item, but that cost is anticipated to go down. Wasn't there an eggshell or egghead company that used to do it? Or my yep. dream? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. It was Energy Eggheads. They were actually part of the Green Tech bid this year. Okay. Um, uh, that, that was uh, part of that bid. Good. So that one was escalated around 5%, and the other vendor kept a flat price for the three years. Good. And that, that gets uh, the processes uh, re residents can apply for and they get that yep. done. We have a, on our website, we have a form that they can fa fill in. They, we contact them. We kind of screen them, ask them a few questions, yeah. um, and then uh, an audit is scheduled for the auditor to come in. And how, how long, Jane, be between audit requests? So they obviously can't do it every year, I wouldn't imagine. Yeah, well, we, we usually say within 18 months we yep. won't pay for a second audit. Um, yep. And then we're going we're gonna to look at the internal process, too, to see what customers are actually doing post-audit. Um, and it has that actually affected their energy use, et cetera. So we're, we're hoping to expand our internal processes along with this new vendor. Okay, great. Um, any discussion from the board? Okay, none appearing. I'll take a vote. Uh, all in favor? 5-0. Okay. Okay. Motion passes. All right. Move the bid 2015-27 for HVAC improvements be awarded to Felitti Brothers, Inc. for $572,243 as the lowest responsive and eligible bidder on the recommendation of general manager. Okay, can we have a second? Second. Yeah. Okay, and Amid, any background for us? Yeah, this, the whole project is gonna cost about $1.2 million, and we spread it over the three years, uh, $600,000 that you know you voted to approve. That's gonna take care of the uh, main unit and the air handler unit number three. That's for this uh, building? That's for this building, yes. And then next year in FY 2000, actually FY 2017, we're going to spend be spending another four hundred thousand dollars, and FY 18 another two hundred thousand dollars, and that would complete the projects. That would in uh, include replacing the boilers, the chillers, as well as the air handling units. There are three of them throughout the building that they all need to be upgraded and cleaning the air duct system right throughout. Um, right. That would, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you, Amit. Uh, uh, thank you. So, uh, could we have a... Just a quick question. Sure, Why does this motion have the word eligible? Is there an issue? What is that? I'm sorry? Bids? 
why does this motion have the word eligible? Is there an issue with the with the bid with this bid? Well, n well, no, there was no issue. This is a standard language they use. The el eligible, you, you know. Okay. Okay. Any other so it's responsible, responsive bidder, basically, okay. but there are so, some subcontractors for this just I haven't seen amount the word also. Yeah. In a motion before. I just, you know, wonder if there was some issue that went on <laughs> with one so of this bid. Actually, we have seen one eligible, I think, last year uh, was someone who didn't meet the requirements in one of the, the uh, backup requirements. Okay. Uh, so I think eligible, yeah. they were rejected because of that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Any other discussion? Yeah. The board? Okay. Not up here. We'll take a vote. All in favor? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Meet. Motion carries 5 0. Uh, I think that concludes our motion. So, <coughs> next on item 12, we just have a review of the upcoming board meetings. Uh, next uh, being Thursday, June 25th. I uh, assume that's still good for everyone scheduled. Uh, Thursday, July 30th. And then we move into September, Thursday, September 24th. So. NEPA conference, right. Right. Okay, yeah, so we have the NEPA conference, and that we, Gene, you sent an email to everyone on the board so they know the process for registering for that. Uh, yeah, they can get that. Yep. Uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, just to confirm, uh, as notified by Gene, we've moved the uh, policy committee meeting from Tuesday, June 2nd to June 23rd, which I can't remember if that's a Tuesday or not. It's a Tuesday, so Tuesday, June 23rd. And um, under the same category of uh, upcoming meetings on Wednesday, June 17th, we have a cab meeting. Do we need a volunteer for that? I one? got it. No, good, Dave. Excellent. My Thank first you. cab meeting. Okay. Very excited. Yeah. Good, <laughs> good luck with that. Good, good luck. Yeah. Was it a rough crowd? Uh, oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a special uh, suit. They, after, we, after we prep them, uh, I guess, yes. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, any other business uh, that we need to uh, discuss? Okay, uh, then I'll take a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Okay. Second. Second. All in favor? Okay. Motion carries 5-0. Meeting adjourned. All right.